You are now listening to the voice of Tamar with Vanessa Santiago. Hey y'all, so here we are. It's time for another podcast and I'm really, really excited about this podcast for a lot of reasons. If you guys know, um, I have a best friend. Her name is Daphne McCleary. And I talk about her often because we have really gone on like a healing journey together and she's just taught me a lot about myself and just a lot about friendships because prior to us really connecting I didn't know what it was like to have a good friend. Daphne tends to be the person I bounce my ideas off of however this time around it ain't about me it's about my best friend and so Daphne tell us who you are. So I'm Daphne I am I guess my job, I'm a social worker. Um, I'm a social worker at heart. I love what I do love helping people. I'm <laughs> Vanessa's best friend, in case y'all didn't know. Uh, I love plants. <laughs> I'm a plant mom. I'm a new plant mom. Okay. Daphne has her own story. I'm going to let her lead and kind of share her own personal experience. So there are lots of stories that I think are kind of like jumbled up in me, but the one that I'll focus on, I guess, is the college experience. So what's important to note is that I do have a history of child sexual abuse. There have been multiple violations from when I was younger until I was college age. And like all of that matters, right? Like I, I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but like typically speaking, a child who has been sexually abused, they're more likely to, to be like re-victimized later on in their life. And that was true for me. Um, and so... By the time I was in high school, I was suicidal for the first time. All this is important to note because of how things kind of went down in college. So fast forward to college, I met this guy pretty early on in the year and he was like, this just, I don't know, he was cute, this gentleman at, the, at that point and really took interest in me. And at that point I had like super low self-esteem. Like I said, I was like, I was kind of like a functioning, a functioning depressed person, like People thought that I was good because I got decent grades and kind of kept up with sports and whatever else I was doing. But like internally, I was just in a terrible place. So I met this guy who was like the first person to ever call me pretty outside of my family, the first person to kind of give any sort of interest in who I was. And so we started kind of dating and things started out just fine. He was, he was cool. He'd be like, oh, you know, you should wait for me so we could eat dinner together. And I'd be like, oh, that's so nice. He wants to eat with me. Uh, and then I had a car and he didn't have a car. That should have been the first red flag. But it wasn't. And so he'd be like, oh, I'll drive. Do you want to go to the store? Like, I'll drive you. No problem. And then he'd like hold my keys for me. You know what I mean? Like, oh, anywhere you want to go, I'll just take you, Davne. And I was like, oh, wow. He just really loves driving me around. Like, that's so sweet. He wants to eat with me and be with me all the time. And then he wouldn't leave my dorm room when I wanted to leave my dorm room. Like, oh, he just wants to spend all this time with me. Things kind of started to take a little bit of a turn like he would start like accusing me of sleeping with other people and at that point like I said like I had never this is my first like true real relationship outside of you know puppy love in high school um, and I had never consensually slept with anybody at that point. I ended up going to this party one night and he did not want me to go. He did not drive me in my car <laughs> to this party and so I was I was there with a couple of friends from my dorm. Um, and at some point in the night, he came to the party. Now I was drinking and God knows what is in the drinks when you go to college parties because none of us are old enough to buy alcohol in the first place. And so it's just kind of like a mix up of whatever cheapest, you know, alcohol you can find, anybody can get from the store. So I was really drunk and I don't even have much of a recollection after he made it to the party. So I know he brought me a drink. I don't know if I was roofied that night. I really couldn't tell you, but I know that after seeing him at the party, I remember like passing um, like a landmark on the way back to my dorm. And then I don't remember anything else from the night, but I do recall waking up or, well, I woke up the next morning um, and didn't have any bottoms on and I didn't have my cell phone. So later on that day, he brought my phone down to me um, and I could see that I had a bunch of calls out to my family and it was like the middle of the night, it was like 3, 4 a.m. So nobody was awake. And like I knew physically that something had happened, but I have no memory of it. So I know that him and his friends brought me back to my dorm based on the stories that I've gotten from other people, you know, who were in the dorm with me. But as far as like what happened, I know I was violated. And um, that is something that I will never have a memory of. And so what was the relationship like after that moment? So that was at like 
um, finals for the first semester, we both left college like maybe a week later, like it was like finals. And I think it was like a celebratory party at the end of finals and he did not come back to, um, to school that following semester. So there was no conversation, there was no, there was no closure to it. I never asked him because I just wasn't that person. And people who know me now don't believe that I was this like really meek, quiet, shy person, but like that's who I was. And I just never felt like I could have approached him about that situation. A lot of people are going to be surprised about you sharing this specific story. Like, why are you sharing? I think it's important for people to understand that like, I, th I think that people who know me or who look at me, um, I don't look like the things that I've been through. And that oh, is, yeah. Jesus entirely has nothing to do with anything that I've done because I, I can't save myself or couldn't have saved myself. But I think that people um, need to recognize that and need to understand that like all of these things might happen to you. Like you also don't have to look like the things you have been through and they, you can still move through life and attain, you know, your goals and, and finish college and get your master's degree and pursue your doctorate and buy a house and do all these things. Like even though there are, there were moments in your life that were like your lowest lows, like there is still life after that. When I think about success sometimes, I think that everybody's always thinking about buying a house and doing all these things. Do you feel like you can accomplish in your career, accomplish things financially and still be like at ground zero when it comes to your healing process? Absolutely. Like I said, a lot of people thought that I was doing great because I got decent grades and, you know, was a a leader or whatever in school and whatnot but like I was at my lowest points at some of my lowest points I was probably achieving the most that I've ever achieved in my life um as far as like academically right or even like financially I had multiple jobs I can hold multiple jobs but I'm still broken right I when I met you I think one of the things I would say to you is that on a scale of one to ten one being the lowest and ten being the highest amount of happy I would only ever hit a three mm -hmm. and that was the happiest I would ever be regardless of I had I think I had my master's degree at that point or was pursuing my master's. So like, absolutely. I don't think that success can really be, can only be measured by the things that we attain. Um, I think that a major success for me was my healing, right? Cause it took so many years and so much time and a lot of different therapists who got it wrong. And then some therapists who finally got it right. And a lot of Jesus and a lot of prayer and a lot of deliverance to kind of get me to a point where I was like stabilized and well. And, and at what point did you realize that you needed to heal? Like you were successful in school, you were successful in everything else. Like at what point were you like, wow, what happened to me has affected me in such a way that I need to aggressively heal? It was probably one of the times that I was suicidal. I would have this like cyclical thing where I would be okay. And then I don't know, for whatever reason, something negative would happen. And then I, I, my low would be so extreme and I would just be like, I don't wanna be alive anymore and I can't get out of bed. And I was working um, at one of the hospitals, just working full time and the stress kind of, of social work, it's already a very stressful field in the first place, was kind of just piling on. And I remember just feeling like, I can't do this. I cannot, I, I don't wanna get out of bed. I don't wanna do anything. I, like, I have no interest in doing the things I used to enjoy. I don't wanna see anybody that I love and I wanna be around my friends or my family. And that to me was a turning point where it's like, I need to get help or I'm going to kill myself. And I chose help. I think that when you're not, when you've not begun your healing process and then you're looking at people who have their healing process, you just see them and you put this on this, put them on this really high pedestal or you see people who are successful and, and you're like, oh, she's never been through anything. You know what I'm saying? And you're not the kind of person that just talks openly about your experiences. You're very one on one when it applies. And so I think it's important for people to know that. And, you know, sometimes people who listen to the podcast are not people who've experienced violations, but they're people who know people who have experienced violations. And so I know that for us, it was so strange because I had experienced violations and you had too. However, I didn't understand how your violations affected your life because in my mind, it was just one way. I was sleeping with men to feel love, to feel control. You, your brokenness looked like something else and, and the hardest part for me to understand like being your friend and sharing the same experience is like well why are you depressed you just need to be happy and so can you kind of talk about how that works because that was a long stint for us to kind of walk through yeah so um 
like you said, I think everybody just deals with things very differently. Um, and the way that I dealt with things was, was to just bring everything inward. And so when I say I was depressed, I meant, I mean, like I had a hard time getting out of bed. I couldn't eat, right? Like I couldn't, I couldn't do anything that I used to love doing. And depression is so much bigger than just being sad, like for a day, like this is, it was like, it felt like a lifetime of sadness, right? Like it felt like it was never gonna end. There was no end in sight. No one can do anything about it. I had been on medication when I was in college. I was on medication again as an adult. I had tried all these different therapists and I was ready to give up because I didn't find a therapist that worked well for me. Um, at the same time, there was stuff going on in my family and so family dynamics are off and then I'm staying you know, with friends who are trying to help me. Or I would lay in bed for, for days and just be in bed not watching TV, nothing. Like I just couldn't, I just couldn't. And so now as you're talking about being on medications for depression, can you talk about your experience with Christians who did not believe that medication or depression was real? Yeah, so I've met in my field because I'm a social worker and then also in my personal life because I've been on medication for depression specifically on two different occasions. Yep, two different occasions. Um, there are a lot a lot of Christians for some reason who just believe that Jesus is the only answer and while I wholeheartedly believe that Jesus is the answer medication is not harmful if it's something that's recommended by your doctor right like I think that there are a lot of people who for whatever reason there's a stigma especially in the black community I'm black I know y'all can't see me because of the podcast <laughs> but I'm black um, especially in our community people just don't believe in taking medications for um, emotional issues and meds don't solve the problem by any means but they definitely make it easier and they fix their the job is to fix different levels in your body and in your brain and chemicals and things like that to to um, kind of just boost your mood and get you to a place where you are able to deal with what you need to deal with without being overwhelmed so i would say to anybody who is struggling with depression who's struggling with anxiety that's a, another big one to um to consult with your doctor and if your doctor is recommending medications i say jesus and therapy jesus and medicine you know until you get to a, a place where you won't need it any longer and my story was that i didn't need it for very long i think i was on medication for the first time for like three months and i went back on medication because i had a meltdown at church and my pastor said i think you might need to get back on your meds and i'm like wow i've never had a pastor say that to me before <laughs> Okay, <laughs> maybe I should. And and I did and things helped. I think the second time I think I was on medications for like six months and um, they made a, a huge difference for me. They just kind of freed me up to be able to allow God to do the work that needed to be done in me because it's not easy. Like it's not like, oh, I have Jesus and now nothing hurts anymore. And oh, I have Jesus and now there's no more pain. Like he's just taking it all away. Like, no, you have to dig through that stuff and sift through it and figure it out for me without having the ability to have that medication like it just it wouldn't have happened i don't think i think that there's a level of shame that comes when you've experienced forms of violation yes. and now getting to a place where you feel like in your own strength and even with the strength that jesus gives you you cannot function without some form of medication like that's another added shame to um your experience and so but i just want to interrupt too that sometimes your medication might look different right so Sure, you can't, like I think that some people may not be actually on medication, but you self-medicate because you drink, or you self-medicate because you sleep with people, or you self-medicate because you masturbate, or you self-medicate because you, whatever, you're on drugs, or whatever it is that, that you choose. Like any form of self-medication, it's like the same, it's the same difference. You're still trying to fill, you're still trying to solve a problem that is not gonna get solved by any of this stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, I'm big on medication, but know that medication also won't solve your problem. How do you feel like your experience in college has completely uh, morphed your life in ways? Um, for many years, I refused to date, right? For many years, I was like, um, there's just, it's just not even worth it. Like men are going to hurt me. Men are dangerous, whatever. Um, and so for multiple years after that violation, like I just pursued, you know, the stuff that, that mattered to me and just dating and being in a relationship was completely off the table and it's something that i always wanted like i always wanted to get married one day you know have a family and whatnot but it was it just felt so unattainable for me so the biggest thing i think is i kind of gave up on that in a sense and i know a relationship and marriage and whatever is not like a goal that you can't like you can't go to school and like there's not like a check mark to get to those things um but a part of me just kind of felt defeated in that i, I would never be able to have that 
And so I think that was a major way that I was impacted. I think it has also impact, has impacted my ability to be vulnerable with people that I care about or people that I love um, because I was violated by somebody who was supposed to take care of me, like who was supposed to care for me in a way that this would never happen. And how do you feel like the people that were around you aided you in your healing process? It took a while for me to, um, to share particularly this situation. Um, but I think that for one, I had friends. Vanessa always talks about how great I was for her, but seriously, we helped each other because there are there's so much growth that I would not have been able to make without Vanessa being in my life. Um, but I, I have great friends, Mariana, if you're listening to this, <laughs> you're a realist. Um, she would drive me to therapy appointments because I would not drive myself. Like she mm -hmm. would go with me to appointments because I needed that and, and she was able to do that for me. Um, I had people that I can call at any point, any time, and if I needed prayer, they would pray with me. I had people who were honest with me um, and held me to a standard of um, doing what's right even though I wasn't feeling great. You know, even, even, even when I didn't feel like eating, they made sure I ate, right? Like things like that. And I, I think that it's so important to have people who are supportive in your life because um, I didn't start this healing journey by talking to my family about it, right? Like I, I talked to my friends, to the people in my life who I knew, um, I knew what their response was going to be because I, I, it just, for me, didn't feel safe for me to start with my family. Not because they wouldn't have cared or not because they, they don't care. I have a fantastic family, y'all are realist. But um, I think that it was just important for me to start with people who I knew could provide something for me, um, even before me asking. What do you feel like people who are supporting those who are going through a healing journey can do to best help someone? It's hard because everybody's journey is very different, but I think the very first thing you can do is listen um, without judgment, right? Like I think that so much shame comes with being violated. Um, and especially like in a situation like mine, like I felt like I was not the perfect victim by any means. Um, I was drunk and I shouldn't have been drinking. I grew up in church, I knew better, right? Like I shouldn't have worn X, Y, and Z or whatever. And so there are all these I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, and things that kind of complicate the situation. And to have, um, I think it's important to have people who can sift through all of that and say, you know what, it doesn't matter. None of, nothing that you did caused you to, um, to be violated and nothing that you did, like you're not to blame for that. It's not your fault. So I think that's the biggest thing, like hammering the message that it is not your fault because there's so much condemnation, so much shame um, just surrounding the things that, like violations that we experience. And that's kind of one of the biggest or one of the hardest for me to climb out of, like not feeling like these things were my fault. Because especially when it happens so many times, you're like, I've, I'm the common denominator. Like there's gotta be something wrong with me because I'm like, it keeps happening to me and it's not happening to anybody else. You know, I don't know anybody else who has such an extensive history like I do. Um, so if you are, I guess, encountered with somebody in your life who has experienced um, a, a sexual violation, I think just listening without judgment, I think affirming them and, and who, they, um, who they are and that they're not to blame for anything that happened to them. And then just finding different ways that you can support them, um, like even in like meeting their actual physical needs. Like I said, I stopped eating for a while and people fed me because I wasn't eating, you know, or, you know, I couldn't clean my house and people came and did my dishes for me because I just, I couldn't do it. Um, I think finding those ways and, and noticing when, um, when people need professional help, right? And offering that like to the best of your abilities or offering to connect them with, with people who know, if, if you don't know what to do, like connect them with people who do. Um, because like I said, like my pastor saying that I probably need to go back on my medications was so important for me because I probably wouldn't have done it if she didn't say that. You were talking about, you know, being really soft-spoken and not um, knowing how to have really hard conversations with people. So how have you, like, developed that skill? When I was younger, I was this super soft, pushover, cry to everything kid, right? Then I was violated so many times that I flipped the script and went to this hard, like, prickly, don't talk to me, no means no, like, just on the other end of the spectrum. So for me, I have had to... Un, like unlearn being super passive and then unlearn being very aggressive to kind of find a middle ground in that. So I don't know. I think it's, I think it's for one understanding, like I had to really understand my value and understand that like 
I am worth having boundaries, right? Like I am worth being safe. Like I, I should be valued because, because I'm here, right? Like I should be valued and I should understand that about myself. And then knowing the things that I do and don't deserve, I had to learn what actual love was, right? I had to learn what actual intimacy is supposed to look like. I had to learn what um, safe and healthy relationship looked like. I had to learn what safe and healthy conflict looked like. So when I learned all those things and then coupled with me knowing that I'm worth being in relationship with people who treat me well and I'm worth being in healthy relationships, I was able to kind of better navigate um, the relationships that I needed to let go or um, boundaries that I needed to put up around people. And some people didn't respect them and some people walked away and that's okay too because I know that I'm value, like valuable. And what are the signs that somebody's not trustworthy enough to be in your space, right? Because I think that that's something that you have taught me. In my mind, it's like if I, if I am in a relationship with you, you get all of me. You get all of my love. You get all of my business, all of my secrets. But everybody cannot handle that. And so how do you determine who gets to be in your close space and arm's length space and just get to know how much sugar you put in your coffee space? Don't make it say how much sugar I put in my coffee. Let's start there. I feel like one of the signs is that they don't tell you other people's business. Mm-hmm. One of the signs is probably that they they are like as open with you as you are with them. Mm. Um, I think that that's really important because it's like it takes vulnerability on your part to share, but it takes vulnerability on their part to then share as well. And so if somebody's not willing to reciprocate that, it's probably it may not be the best um, the best place to to share all your secrets. Um, I think that it's important to have people, like when you're sharing things with people or when you're considering doing that, like it's important to know about them. Like, you know, the very first day you meet, now granted, the very first day Vanessa and I met, (laughs) things were a little off. They were a little weird, honestly. She's like, so tell me about your violations. I'm like, how did you even know that I was like, it was really strange. Um, But like, usually people who kind of start a conversation giving their entire life story, it's, it's, it signifies that they lack some boundaries and they may not be the best person to share things with. Now, I really believe that God's hand was all over our friendship because there is no oh reason God. why we are, <laughs> like why we would have expected to be come from there to here. Um, so there are exceptions, obviously, to the rule, but I, the biggest sign, if this person is a gossip, if this person is telling you everybody else's business, um, I guarantee you that they are telling yours to the next, probably the person they were talking to you about. And with you saying that, I was just thinking, you know, our friendship was usually it said that usually people say like the blind can't lead the blind and oh, maybe blind. I know. And even establishing a really um, tight knit relationship with someone who's experienced some of what you have, but like you guys haven't navigated through that. It's just not a great thing, right? It's like two addicts coming together. What are the chances that they're, they're going to trigger each other into going into bad habits? Mm-hmm. And so I know that our, <laughs> our situation was unique (laughs) but what what advice do you give to two people who are like really great friends who have experienced the same kind of trauma but have seen no growth growth or fruit in their relationship you really have to be honest with yourself right throughout your process of healing like you um i had a i had a therapist say to me once she was she was telling me a story it wasn't about me because i don't be lying in therapy i'm not lying but um she said i can counsel a lie right like i can sit here i can counsel a lie and we can talk through it but it's going to be a lie right if you're not going to tell me the truth we can't get to the root of whatever the issue is and so it's the same thing in your relationships like if you cannot be honest with yourself and recognizing that like um that things are toxic i think both of us and that's one thing we both notice right like things are not good yeah. <laughs> things are not healthy Ugh. right and we both took a step back and we're able to be introspective and think about what am i doing that's contributing to something that making the situation worse right and how can i make it better what can i be doing what do i need to commit to beyond what vanessa can do for me vanessa could never make me live right there's nothing vanessa could ever do that would make me want to heal there's nothing vanessa could ever say to me that will heal me, right? But I had to be committed to that on my own. I had to be decided on my own. Um, And then I think it's also really important to, when you have these goals set, right? Like if my goal is I wanna go to therapy every other week to have somebody that encourages you. If this person's not encouraging you towards healing, then they are pulling you away from it. Yeah. Can't have it both ways. So we always like to close out our podcast with prayer. Take us up, best friend. 
Oh, Father, so I just thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice who's listening uh, to this podcast. I thank you for every survivor. I thank you, Father, for everyone who has survived any sort of violation right now. And I, I just thank you that you are a God who sees them and you know them and you love them. Um, and I just pray right now that anyone who is struggling right now, that you will send them the resources, that you will highlight people in their life that they can go to, that they can trust, that they can share their story with God, that you will um, just begin to highlight a pathway to healing for some people who feel like there isn't one God. I thank you that you are a God who knows us um, in our most innermost parts and so I thank you for everyone who is struggling with anything with depression with anxiety God that they will not feel shame and the things that they're feeling but they will seek out a therapist and seek out your Holy Spirit seek you out God as the as the major healer God as the only one who can really heal and that you will do a deep work in their hearts right now God I thank you just for everyone who is a support person to someone who has been violated that you will give them the things that they need to say or the the suggestions that they need to make that will push their friend or push their um, whoever on their journey towards healing God and we just thank you that you are a good God um, and that you do care and that you care so deeply about us that you don't want to leave us in this place so much so that you orchestrated that they would be listening to this podcast in this very moment and hear this message God so I just thank you for each and every person who hears this Lord and just pray that um, you will just continue to be with all of us and, and continue to heal us um, as we walk forward on this journey called life. Amen. I appreciate you for being on this friend. Thank you for having me. All right. God is faithful. We're cool. We're hip. We're fun. (laughs) All right, bye, (laughs) y'all.